Yesterday Upon the Stair by Pit Viper of Doom Chapter 32 When Sekijiro Khan, class 1B's homeroom teacher, walks outside before dawn, it's to the side of Aizawa standing in the road watching the back of a bus as it drives away. There's a coffee mug in his hand, the contents long gone cold, and Aizawa barely bats an eye when his colleague steps up beside him. There's a moment of contemplation of Sekijiro looking at his mug, then at the expression on Aizawa's face, then at the slowly disappearing bus before realization hits. Holy crap! So you actually did it! Aizawa shifts, tries to take a sip, then pulls a face and pours the rest out. You almost sound surprised. You held out pretty long, Shakijiro says. We were starting to wonder if your entire class might make it through the first year. I think a few of us owe Kayama some money now. Fantastic. Aizawa's voice is caustic. Good to know this is benefiting her and amusing all the rest of you. Sekijiro winces. I'm sorry, he says. It must not have been an easy decision. I don't know why everyone seems to think it is. Aizawa rounds on him. I don't know why my string of back luck with students has convinced everyone that I can decide to accept my own complete failure on a whim. Aizawa! I let students go when they have zero potential. Aizawa scowls off in the direction the bus has taken. If they have even a shred of it at the start, then that's something I can work with. I thought I could work with him. Who was it? Sagajiro asks cautiously. One of the remedial students, I take it? No, Minera Minoru. Sagajiro's eyebrows shoot upward. Oh! I was planning to place him in the remedial class the moment he put a toe wrong, Aizawa says. But it wouldn't do anything. You sure? Sekijiro asks. I mean, you mentioned him before, and so is Kayama, but he's a teenage boy, you know. It happens, but it doesn't mean he can't learn. That's what I thought. That's what I was hoping. Aizawa shakes his head. But there was too much I already let slide, and this time it led to Sosaki's nephew getting hurt. He's fine, he adds quickly. But it was a close thing, and all Mineta had to say about it. His response to the fact that his actions put a civilian child in danger was to call that child a self-righteous little shit. He pauses at Shigeru's sharp intake of breath. He probably didn't mean for me to hear that. But I did, and I realize now that I can't help him. And I can't in good conscience allow him to move forward. He rubs his face, looking tired. Bakugo I can work with. Bakugo's problem is that he's proud and spoiled, but at least there's some part of him that wants to do good. Mineta never wanted that, and so there's nothing I can do for him. Sounds like it's for the best, Sekijiro tells him gently. And, hey, there are other promising kids out there. Kids with their hearts in the right place. This just means there's more space for them to move up. Those are kids you can help. Yeah, Aizawa says. Yeah, I intend to. Shoto doesn't mind early warnings as a concept. In his father's house, he loathed them. In his father's house, they begin with heavy footsteps approaching his door, with sitting bolt upright so he wouldn't be caught lying down, with an ungenerous bare bones breakfast and whatever basic training his father could fit in before releasing him to go to school. It means closing his eyes through the first hours of the day before he steps out the door and lets himself breathe again. Today, it begins with Ida's voice booming throughout the boy's dorm, followed by a ragged chorus of soft groans of protest. Shoto sits up with more care than he usually does, because this time he has a cat on his chest. On one side, Kaminari attempts to burrow further beneath the covers. On the other, Midoriya flaps over and kicks him in the side. Everyone is groggy and sleep tousled, and mornings have never felt so bizarrely comfortable. I feel really weird, Midoriya says over breakfast, which is simple but far less Spartan than Shoto is used to. Weird how? Arabaka asks. She's eating with her eyes closed, too sleepy to keep her eyelids up. Midoriya doesn't seem to have that problem. I don't know, he says thoughtfully. I think I might be dying. Arabaka lists to the side until she bumps his shoulder. Thank you, no! You look fine. Shoto informs him patiently. I know, I feel fine too. It makes me suspicious, Midoriya frowns. Am I floating? I feel kind of floaty. Ojiro is sitting near enough to overhear and lets out a quiet chuckle. Midoriya, have you seen your face lately? I could swear those bags under your eyes have gotten smaller. You're not dying, you're well rested. 
a Rebecca chokes out a sob that Shoto is fairly sure is fake. I'm so proud, she says. I'm jealous, Sarah groans. I'll always take forever to sleep when I'm somewhere new. First night of camping is always the worst. How do you even do in Minoria? Minoria shrugs and mumbles and fills his mouth with food to keep from having to answer. Speaking of things that make me lose sleep at night, Araraka pipes up. Where did Mineta go? At this question, all the other girls jump. Ashido scoots back in her seat and checks under the table. Jiro lifts her feet up to sit cross-legged. Shoto glances to his other seat neighbor. Yo, Yorozu, he asks. She lowers her chopsticks, lips pursed. He was sent home, apparently, first thing in the morning. Aizawa sensei had him get up even earlier than the rest of us. Ida and I were informed last night, but we don't know the details. That's weird, Kaminari remarks. He wasn't even in the remedial class, and I don't think he did any worse in that forest obstacle course than the rest of us. Aizawa sensei will be making announcements after breakfast. Ida pitches his voice over the rest of the chatter. I'm sure whatever needs explaining will be disclosed then. By 5.30, the whole class is gathered outside and dressed in gym uniforms, most of them still rumbled and yawning. Shono is reasonably awake. It's hardly any earlier than he's used to, and thus far, the morning has been much slower paced. The only others who seem unaffected by the hour are Ida, Oyorozu, Midoriya, and Togoyami, though in the latter case, Todoroki just can't reach his expression past the beak of famous. Good morning, everyone. Aizawa greets them. Your training begins today. This summer, we will be reinforcing what you learned last term, as well as pushing you well past your physical and mental limits. A few of them wince. The purpose of this training will be to strengthen your quirks and prepare you for the examinations for provisional licenses. Aizawa's eyes narrow. That's so we will be preparing you for life or death scenarios, aggressive and hostile enemies, and in other words, real hero work. A provisional license will authorize you to perform that work, so we'll be spending the summer making sure you earn it. His eyes rove over the glass. And on that note, Madada will not be continuing his training this summer. Shoto sees more than a few perplexed looks passed back and forth among his classmates. Nor will he be continuing in the fall. Aizawa adds and the confusion turns to shock. Wait, what? Kamanari blurts. But he passed the final! He wasn't even in remedial training! As of last night, Mineta Minoru is no longer a student in the UA hero course. Aizawa goes on, ignoring Kamanari's outburst. The behavior that he displayed last night was unacceptable for a hero in training, and has been unacceptable since he began. Aizawa's face is like stone. Let me be clear. I was lenient in dealing with his missteps. Far more lenient than was called for. I will not make the same mistake twice. While you are in my class, and while you are attending UA, you will show your fellow students, your teachers, and your peers the respect that is due them. You will respect boundaries. You will respect consent. You will afford your classmates common courtesy. If you are incapable of that, then you have no place in my class, in this school, or in this profession. Yo, Yorozu is standing next to Shoto, and he sees her shift to stand taller. A sigh of relief can be heard coming from the empty space above Hagagare's shirt collar. Shoto shifts his weight from foot to foot, burying his sudden deep dread. Minera had been unpleasant, and privately Shoto isn't too broken up to see him gone. His social graces aren't the best, but even he couldn't miss how miserable the girls were around his now former classmates. But in spite of that, Mineta was clever and strong in his own right. He had a good understanding of his own quirk, he was smart enough to make the top ten in academics, and he made it through the USJ attack just like the rest of them. He managed to pass the final while his partner Ciro was stuck with remedial training, meaning that Mineta had more or less passed that test on his own. And even with all those qualities and abilities... He's still been kicked out on attitude and character alone. Shoto knows his strengths. He knows he's clever and strong and skilled with his quirk and good in academics. He's not quite so certain about his character. We'll be upgrading your quirks, Aizawa Sensei tells them, and that's exactly what they proceed to do. It's grueling, of course, but on the bright side, the other half of the pussycat team finally joins in. 
from what Izuku can guess, while Mandalay and Pixie Bob welcome Class 1A yesterday, Ragdoll and Tiger had been busy getting Class 1B settled in. But now everyone's together, it's still mid-morning, and Izuku feels like he could flip down and pass out where he stands. He doesn't, of course. That would defeat the purpose. There are 40, well, 39 now, students in these woods and only four trainers besides their homeroom teachers, but the pussycats are professionals and their quirks are just as suited for wide simultaneous training as they are for mountain rescue operations. Pixie Bob's earth quirk turns the landscape into specialized training fields and obstacle courses. Mandalay's quirk is telepathy and lets her mentally broadcast instructions over multiple students at once. Ragdoll Search lets her keep track of up to 100 people at once, including weaknesses, and Tiger is... Tiger is... Hmm. Izuku's mouth tastes like dirt and sweat because that's all he's eaten since breakfast. He's long given up fretting over the sweaty sting in his eyes because it's been hours since it started, and Izuku is quickly learning to prioritize. As a rescue hero, Tygo's quirk lets him stretch and flatten his body to get through narrow spaces as needed. As a teacher, he's like an unholy amalgamation of All Might, Miss Nana, and Gran Torino. He's loud, he's strong, and he does not let up. Not that Izuku would want him to, of course. Your quirk doesn't need strengthening, Nana had once told him. You do. She's still right. Gran Torino helped him find a way to harness one for all more consistently, but 5% is still a measly 5%. That's a kitten sneeze to the kind of power he's seen All Might wield with his little finger without breaking it. That's not something Izuku can catch up with overnight. Sometimes he wonders if he'll ever reach 100 by the time he graduates, but that's future Izuku's problem. Present Izuku's problem is, I wonder if I can nudge it up to 6 Push to the limit, Tiger tells him when he lands on his ankle wrong and ends up limping for a few minutes. Push to the limit, he says while Izuku struggles to get his lungs working again after he misses a black and takes a blow to the gut. Push to the limit, he says shortly after sending Izuku a sprawling face down in the dirt for the 50th time that day. Ray helps him up, asks him if he wants her to give Tiger a hard time and scowls petulantly when he shakes his head. This is good. This is a good thing. He pauses to catch his breath when Tiger moves on to help Sato. His arms aren't shaking yet, so he activates full cow and drops to do a set of push-ups while he waits. What do you think? He mumbles with minimal lip movement. It's awkward to do push-ups with his head raised to look at her, but it's the only way to see what she signs. That boy is here, she tells him. The one that punched you. He's watching you and some of the others, but mostly you. Oh... His chest feels tighter at that. The one with wings, too, she says, and Izuku has to pause before he sprains his wrist by accident. I don't see him all the time. When I do, he's watching you. I don't know why. He won't talk to me. I don't like him. He's just scared, Izuku mumbles, then lifts the hand that he almost messed up and folds it behind his back. Adjusting his weight, he continues his push-ups on one arm. You know, you don't have to stay with me. I haven't figured out how to train my first quirk yet. I don't want you to get bored. Instead of answering, Ray simply frowns and watches Tiger train with Sato. Let me try something, she answers. Define something? I want to try to touch him. Really? Touch him, I mean. I think I can do it. Izuku's eyes widen and he finally pauses and puts one knee down. How can I help? I don't know. When Tiger comes back to him, Izuku throws himself into a spar. It's not his best because he's trying to keep one eye on Ray at the same time, but the point of this exercise is raw strength, not fine precision detail. Ray hovers at the edges of the fight, pacing and circling like she's deciding where to pounce. She reaches out from time to time, clawing and swiping, but her hands go through Tiger the same as they always do. Izuku keeps one for all activated, reveling in the feeling of lightning in his veins. When Ray drifts close, he feels the hairs on his arm stand on end. The static charge makes his skin prickle until he dodges a blow from Tiger and steps into Ray's space. She blinks away, vanishes, and reappears behind Tiger, reaching out with a pale hand for his broad shoulder. It's a fraction of a second, just an instant. But Izuku is watching, always watching for weakness, just like Nana taught him, and he sees Tiger's split-second glance over his shoulder. Izuku throws a punch and catches him in the side before he has the chance to manipulate his body around it. Tiger's roar of laughter almost deafens him, and Izuku is rewarded with another ungentle fall. 
He glimpses Ray on his way down and finds her staring at her hand with a wide, wide smile on her face. When he staggers back up, Tiger is still grinning at him, and Izuku arranges his tired face into a grin of his own. As Tiger's booming voice calls him back to attention, movement catches his eye in the trees beyond their training ground. Kota lurks in the shadows, half hidden behind a tree trunk, and meets his eyes with a dark scowl. Before Izuku can react, the boy turns and vanishes into the underbrush with the ghosts of his parents always at his side. Ragdoll doesn't like to toot her own horn, but she's pretty sure she's keeping busiest for the least reward. Tiger's giving the kids face-to-face -face lessons. Pixie Bob gets to show off and wow everyone by turning glades and ravines into obstacle courses. And Mandalay's talking into everyone's heads. That's how it usually is. Tiger, Pixie, and Mandy are the face, the muscle, and the voice of her operation. And little old Rags gets to be the brains and the eyes. It's a good job. Her favorite job. And the best part about it is knowing nobody else can do it but her. Eraserhead and Blood King brought them 39 kittens, and Ragdoll can keep tabs on them from any vantage point. She is the vantage point. Pixie Bob looks to her to know who needs what. Mandy looks to her for where to send instructions, and Tiger... Well, Tiger mostly does his own thing. That's Tiger for you. But she can give him advice on who needs strengthening and how. That's a complicated question, though, because everyone here needs strengthening in every possible way. Ragdoll smiles to herself and taps Mandy to whisper in her ear. Tell Todoroki-kun he's about to pass out from heat exhaustion, she says. Miss Kendo needs to work on her footwork. Shiozaki's never going to last long in a fight if she stays in one spot and doesn't move. Ojiro sprained his ankle, and it's not the kind you could just walk off. The list goes on. Ragdoll is good with names. She has to be with a quirk like hers. She has to talk slow, too, or Mandy won't have enough time to transmit it all. Not that she blames her. Once upon a time, it was all a bit much for Ragdoll, too, back when she was a teensy little kitten in training herself. When she was little, one of the happiest days of her life was figuring out where the off switch was, because without that, her mind wasn't the pleasantest place to be. Even before she got her range up to a hundred, where everyone was and what they were doing and where they were weakest was an awful lot to cram into one head. It left her so busy sorting through it all that she missed things right in front of her nose. Now? Now she misses nothing. She's not even looking for him, and she still feels it. Midoriya Izuku, Class 1A, wandering away from Tiger. He's out of breath with sore muscles and a stiff right hand, and he's sidled away from Tiger while he's distracted with a few of the others. Ragdoll wrinkles her nose. Naughty, naughty. It's so close to lunchtime, too. If he plays hooky, she'll have to tell the racer head, and he's been prickly ever since he sent one of his kittens home. She's just leaning over to tell Mandalay so her partner can send him a quick mental slap on the wrist when she tracks his progress and realizes he's heading straight for them. Something wrong? Mandy asks. Hold that thought! Ragdoll chirps back and darts away to head him off. She means to sneak up on him, but he scampers up to her before she has the chance. Oh, Miss Ragdoll! I was looking for you! Are you busy? Ragdoll blinks, narrows her eyes, and squints at his face for a moment. He's not lying. Not skipping out then, just taking a break from Tiger, and that's silly. Who would ever need a break from Tiger? Tiger is a delight! She already shows her teeth when she smiles. Don't be silly, she tells him. I'm always busy. Tetsu Tetsu's metal shell is breaking. He's reached his limit, and so early, too. Tsuno Tori stepped on a jutting stone, and now the frog on her hoof is bleeding. Asui's thirsty. Aoyama's about to lose what's left of his breakfast. I was hoping to ask you something. Midoriya says and wipes some of the dirt and sweat from his face. That's a nice little scar he has. Nothing wrong with that eye, though. It's just a mark. You said your quirk lets you see weaknesses? That's right, she says. She's starting to remember now because Pixie told her Midoriya likes heroes, likes quirks, and likes finding answers to questions more than anything else. Is there any that jump out at you? Midoriya asks her. On me, I mean? Hmm... Ragdoll taps her chin. Is this cheating? This feels like it ought to be cheating, but then this isn't a test, it's training. And she's supposed to be a teacher right now, isn't she? If she's a teacher and it isn't a test, then what's the harm in helping him find the answers? Well, the biggest thing jumping out at me is that right hand of yours. He wrings the hand a bit. It's just a little stiff. Well, you know what they say, a little goes a long way, doesn't it? She taps one of her paw gloves on her chin. Besides that, you're big and loud and in your face, and that's all well and good, but you don't have the muscle to back it up yet. She tilts her head to look at him sidelong, which is why skipping out on Tiger to asking questions you already know the answers to might not be the smartest move, don't you think, Midoriya-kun? 
Pixie says you're smart. You already know your weaknesses, don't you? He blinks at her. What about mental ones? Hmm? She tilts her head the other way. You're right, I did know that, he admits a little sheepishly. I know my, um, physical weaknesses, and I sort of know how I can get past them, too. But what about mental weaknesses? Can your quirk detect those, too? Before she can answer, he pushes ahead. Because I know what I have to do, but I don't always know how to go about doing it. Sometimes it feels like something's blocking me, and it's not something like this. He taps his crooked hand. Or just how big my muscles aren't. I feel like part of it's how I think, and it's harder to tell what that is and how to get past it. I was just wondering if you could, with your quirk. Ragdoll hums again, lets it drag out as she taps her foot in time to her thoughts. No one's ever thought to ask her this before, besides Mandy, when they were younger. Mm, no, probably not. My quirk deals in physical weaknesses only. Bum legs and broken arms and bad backs, you know? His shoulders slump a bit. But that doesn't mean I can't still answer your question, because, because, because that's only what my quirk does. But I can do more than that. He breaks up at that, and Ragdoll mentally brains a little. She's getting the hang of this teacher thing. And Tiger has been wanting to take on sidekicks. Maybe they could give it a shot. I'm a people person. Anything my crook can't see, I can learn to read without it. That's how I knew you really wanted my help, and you weren't just hiding from Tiger. Midoriya looks at her like that's the strangest thing he's ever heard. Why would I want to hide from Tiger? This kitten should be careful, or Ragdoll might start to lag him. No idea! But tell me more about your mental blocks. Mandy might have telepathy, but I'm good with my things. Baka goes around to start giving out, and he needs a break. Yeah, your bozo is hungry, and she can't jump around and make things as fast as she could if she tried just a bit harder. Oh, and there goes over Baka's breakfast. Some of it got on Manama, and he's hopping now, and his balance is just awful. How do you keep it all straight? Midoriya asks, and for a moment, Ragdoll wonders if he's the one that has telepathy, not Mandy. It's so many moving parts, isn't it? So many things to keep track of. How do you go through it all and find what you need instead of being overwhelmed? Practice, she replies. Years of practice. There's no quick way around that. But first I had to try. I blocked it all out at first, all those little things, and you can do that too, if you want, and just focus on what's in front of you. She clips the tip of his nose with a glove. But then you miss all the good stuff if you block it out. If you don't want to miss it, you have to let it in. That's what I did. I let it in and my mind grew around it to fit it all in. Practice. Break up all the noisy things into smaller, bite-sized things. It's hard and it takes time to get good at. It's not something you perfect overnight. It's his own fault, really, for asking all these questions and knowing things, finding things, learning all the things he can fit into that fluffy little head. But if he's smart, he'll get it all straightened out. He looks thoughtful, which is good. Thoughtful means he's listening. That makes sense, he says and holds up his scarred hand. What about things like this? He pauses. I don't know if this is a question you can answer, but you know weaknesses, right? What about weaknesses that can't be fixed? Because this can't be fixed and it's my own fault and... Well, like you said, it's just a little stiff, but a little goes a long way. He surges her face. Is there a way to keep it from slowing me down besides just strengthening the rest of me? Ragnall crosses her arms to keep her hands from twitching. Oh, that's a tougher one, she says. But I do have an answer, and it's this. She leans forward a bit. Not everyone's like me. He blinks at her, and she adds, Not everyone can keep it all straight, you see. He blinks again, and then his eyes widen. Does he have it? It's like you with mental weaknesses, he says thoughtfully. You can't sense them with your quirk, so you can only rely on what you see. So if they see it wrong, then... Clever kitten. Ragdoll smiles until all her teeth are showing. Lots of people like to pretend they don't have any weaknesses, she says. And that's all well and good, but everyone knows that everyone has weaknesses. So even if you try that on someone who isn't me, they'll just keep looking and looking until they find it. But if they think they've found it, then they'll stop looking, Midoriya says. And the look on his face is sharp and thoughtful enough that he almost looks like a cat himself. All he's missing is slit pupils in his eyes. He wrings his stiffed hand. I can make them ignore this and go after a weakness that isn't there. It takes a good liar, Ragdoll tells him. Do you think you can tell a lie without talking? I don't think I've tried it before. He smiles back at her with those sharp little cat's eyes. And all bets are off, Ragdoll likes this one. She feels like she could disagree and manages to restrain herself from bouncing on the balls of her feet. But it's quite the close thing. 
Eraserhead is an amazing hero and a great teacher, and Tiger is her best friend, who she loves with all her heart. But they have such one-track minds when it comes to strength because, well, men! She's still smiling, and she sends him running back to Tiger. Ragdoll has always liked the clever heroes just a bit better than the powerful ones. Won't it be interesting to see one who's both at the same time? Lunch! Ejiro doesn't mean to shout it loud enough to make both Aoyama and Hagagare jump. It just comes out that way. Most important meal of the day! Pretty sure that's breakfast! Ashido tells him. I'm pretty sure it's more useful if you shove it in your mouth and shut the fuck up! Like a go growls, Ejiro can see his hands shaking from across the table. Aizawa used him in a quick demonstration to show everybody how little their quirks had developed since the first day of school, and judging by the near non-stop explosion since this morning, Bakugo took it a little personally. Ejiro shrugs and compromises by putting food in his mouth but continuing to talk. Seriously though, I was with Tiger for about an hour this morning and I'm pretty sure he tried to kill me. Ajino pats him none too gently. There, there, you'll live, she assures him. At least the food's good, he sighs. The food's born as shit, Bakugo snaps. It's not that bad. It's fucking bland. Ajino bursts out laughing. Bakugo, you're talking to the guy who wants a drywall out of dare. Ajino! Ajino almost wails, but it's quickly drowned out when Bakugo stops eating to go on. Are you serious? You fucking idiot! And Digital can't be too upset now because Bunker goes laughing like he actually thinks it's funny. What the fuck was this? We knew each other in middle school, Ajido says a little smugly. We were in our third year. And that, Ajido realizes, is a perfect reminder and segue into that favor he promised Midoriya. What about you, Bakugo? He asks. What was your friend crowd like before you I? I look a distaste across his Bakugo's face and he shrugs. Pfft, what friend crowd? I just had a couple of dickheads following me around because I had the best quirk in our entire class. As she does wrinkles her nose. Sheesh, Bakugo, do you even remember their names? No. How uh, about before that, then? Ajito presses. Like, grade school? Come on, you can't tell me you never had any friends. Or was it just Midoriya? And that, Bakugo bridles. What the fuck? Fuck no, he wasn't my only friend. We weren't even friends. He just followed me around back then and he wouldn't leave me alone. Come on, Bakugo. Tell us. As you know, drums the table lightly. I want to know what kind of crazy kids hung out with little Bakugo. The look he gives her could split rock. Never say that again, he rolls his eyes. Fuck, it was long ago and I haven't heard from any of them for years. There was this kid that could regrow his fingernails. Weird little shit. Some kids with wings. Tsubasa or something. Tsubasa? Ejiro tries not to look like he's frantically jumping on the name. This is kind of familiar. What was he like? Maybe we had a mutual friend. He had bat wings, so that wasn't as useless as it could have been. Bakugo shrugs. Again, he mostly just followed me around. And after grade school, he fucked off to a different middle school, and I never saw him again. Ejiro's heart sinks in for a moment. Even Bakugo seems not quite unbothered by it. Yeah, what do I care? We only knew each other because his grandpa was Decker's pediatrician. Ejiro blinks. Wait, really? Yeah, I think Tsubasa wanted to be a doctor, too, or some shit. Well, no, fuck that. He wanted to be a hero, but that was his backup plan. It would not shut up about how smart his fucking grandpa was. It was annoying as shit. Aww. As she elbows him a few times. Look at you getting all nostalgic. It's kind of a cute sign to you. Eat me. Ejiro turns back to his food and hopes that this little information will be enough for Midoriya. Izuku's mind buzzes as he grazes his way through lunch. Ragda was right for all that she didn't quite know what he was talking about. So far, he's been keeping his first quirk apart from his hero training, or only letting a bit of it leak through at a time, and that's due for a change. It won't be as easy with his quirk as it was for hers, because the dead are still their own people, and if he is going to involve them, then that takes convincing. He stabs his res with his chopsticks a little moodily. The only one he can consistently practice with is Ray, because the other ghosts present are either devoted to someone else like Tensei and the Water Horses, unstable and erratic like Tsubasa, or, well, the only one left is Hino. Izuku isn't even sure where Hino is most of the time. How is he supposed to let it all in and learn to accommodate it all if there aren't enough ghosts around when he actually has the chance to practice? Everything all right, Mentoria? Yao Yorozu asks, gently fending Mika off from her food. Just thinking over training, Izuku answers. 
is allowed to chew over. Izuku pauses, chopsticks halfway through his mouth. Was that a fun? I guess so, sure. I know what you mean, now Yorozu says. Her plate is piled even higher than Izuku's, and for good reason. She looks a great deal thinner than she did that morning. Miga sniffs at it again until Yorozu lifts her off the table and deposits her on the bench. She must notice Izuku staring at her plate because she flushes pink. I have a metabolism, she says sheepishly. I wasn't judging, he says, embarrassed. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. That actually makes sense with your quirk. That mass it takes to create... I mean, with the law of conservation of matter, his voice trails off. You're, um, right, Yaoyorozu replies, and her blush fades as she pets Mika. Sorry for getting defensive, I just keep half expecting Mineta to... Never mind, but you're right, the more I eat, the more I can create. Is it the same for your quirk? Izuku asks, turning to Dodorogi, where a moment his friend looks startled at being abruptly included. Uh, eating doesn't really make any difference. No, I mean, your right side. Izuku says. The water has to come from somewhere, right? A lot of it comes from water vapor in the air, Todoroki answers, but also from me. I can't produce nearly as much ice if I'm dehydrated, so I guess there is some comparison. From there, Yaoyorozu draws Todoroki into a discussion of cork biology, and Izuku listens until he finishes his food. He gets up to take his dishes in, then checks the time. There are 15 minutes left to the lunch period, and 15 minutes is plenty of time to explore a little more, especially with Ray tugging at him and signing, I found the boy with wings. Tsubasa lurks further into the woods, a pulsing mass of poltergeist anger that bleeds into the air like toxic fumes. Izuku isn't nearly as sensitive to it as Ray seems to be, but it still turns his stomach when he gets too close. With Ray keeping watch, Izuku creeps closer as slowly as he might approach a wild animal. He's off the path in the trees and quite frankly glad of it. It means no one's around when Tsubasa lashes out again. Only one of his claws catches on Izuku's arm before Ray drives him back. That's good. It's easy to explain away one little scratch. Wait! But Tsubasa is gone. Frustrated, he returns to the main path and rubs at the angry red welt on his forearm. He's following me, isn't he? He says, he's following me, and whenever I get close, he attacks me. Why? What does he have against me? Is it because he used to bully me? Is he just stuck in the habit? Ray pulls a face and twirls her finger by your ear. That's very helpful, Izuku sighs. His frustration doesn't last long because Mika meets him halfway to the dining hall, and Izuku stoops to scoop her up in his arms. It's hard to stay mad with a cat woman purring against your chest, even when it's the height of summer and you don't really need more heat. He isn't dangerous, is he? Mr. Izumi materializes out of the trees, and Izuku adjusts Mika in his arms before he answers. Tsubasa good? I don't know. So far, the only person I've seen him get rough with is me. We've tried talking to him, the ghost tells him. But he's... I know, Izuku says and drops his voice. He hasn't gone near Kota, has he? No, but I still worry. I don't like the feel of him. Do you know how he died? Izuku's stomach turns as Mr. Izumi speaks. It... It must have been something awful for him to end up like that. I don't know, Izuku monitors. I'm trying to find out. If you happen to see him or see anything notable about him, Mr. Izumi smiles. I'd be happy to help. Izuku ends up spending the rest of lunch at the designated training area where he's been with Tiger all morning, stretching out his sore muscles. Is nearly useless because Mika decides that now is the best time to start climbing him like a cat tower, and it's very hard to stretch properly when he can't stop sniggering. After a few minutes, he gives up and sits down to give her a thorough petting. Ray tells him Kota is coming before the boy comes storming through, swinging a long stick in one hand. Izuku sees him first and sees the look of angry shock when the boy notices he's there. Not sure what else to do, Izuku continues to twirl a long bit of grain grass in front of Mika's nose so she can bat at the seated end. Hey, fuck off, the boy tells him. Izuku has only one play in his book, but it hasn't failed him yet. Want to get in on this? Izuku asks. I don't have any treats you can give her, but she likes people and she likes to play. I don't want to talk to a lame-ass wannabe hero, Kota says flatly. That's fair, Izuku says, heart sinking. Do you hate cats, too? Cody keeps glaring at him like he's too proud to admit there's something he doesn't hate. Izuku puts down the grass and gives Mika a scratch into the chin. If you want to play with her while I'm training, you can, he says and looks at Mika instead of Kota. 
She might get lonely otherwise. You want me to watch a stupid cat while you're too busy to take care of it? Your own damn self? Coda's voice burns with blistering scorn. Izuku winces. She can take care of her own self, I think, he says. And you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm just saying you can if you do. He looks up a moment later, and Kota is gone. A few of his classmates and students from Class B filter in, and Mika doesn't run off until Tiger arrives to continue training for the afternoon. Ray taps on his arm at one point, which he pauses for a breather, and points. Izuku follows the direction of her finger and finds Kota in the distance, running through the trees toward the path, dragging a bulrush for Mika to chase.